Okay, this is going to be a quick tutorial on the First Crusade. Uh, I will go over the people involved, the route, and the outcome. Okay, so the, the precursor to the First Crusade is the Byzantines. Remember the Byzantine Empire? Well, at this point, the empire is led by Emperor Alexius I. Now, the Byzantines had lost much of their territory to a group of people called the Seljuk Turks. And the big battle that really put the nail in the coffin for the Byzantines as far as their territory in that part of the world was the Battle of Manzikert in 1071. And literally, the Turks were at the doorstep of Constantinople. Alexius needed help. Now keep in mind, Alexius is an Eastern Orthodox Christian the patriarch of the Orthodox Church appointed by the Emperor. In the West, you have Pope Urban II. Alexius asks for help. What he has in mind is hundreds of well-trained knights that he can use at his disposal. What he gets is something altogether different. Now this is a little map of the various battles that the Byzantines had lost uh, after Manzikert. Now, who were the Seljuk Turks that were causing all these problems for the Byzantines? Well, they were a Turkish people who had been spreading through Byzantine territory. There's one particular warlord by the name of Kilij Arslan who was one of the major figures. Now, as they arrived on the scene, they harassed pilgrims. And pilgrims are people who were traveling to Jerusalem from the west and the east uh, for religious purposes. They also controlled Jerusalem. They absolutely threatened Byzantine security. They were a legitimate threat. But what's very important to remember here is Islam was not the united force it had once been. When we talked about the Abbasids earlier in the year and the Umayyads, they are not the united force front that they once were. Enter Pope Urban II. He issues a call at Clermont and his speech is full of full of half-truths. Volunteers take up the cross. And the English translation of what they were chanting, God wills it. And they sewed cross, crosses on their shoulders and on their breasts as they prepared to march. Now, what was Urban's reasons? for making this call. Does he want to help Alexius I? Absolutely. Sure he does. Are there other reasons why Pope Urban makes the call? Absolutely. Uh, if the knights are going to be fighting, why not have them fighting the infidel? So he sees this an opportunity as, as saving Europe from the hands of these knights. And the knights that go on this crusade, they're not nice people. Uh, they are, for the most part, killers. That's what they do. They're not the kind of people you're going to want to invite to a dinner party. And Pope Urban knows this. And Urban sees it's in the best interest of Western Christendom if he sends this massive army east. So, he sends the massive army, army east. You will have relative peace and hopefully economic prosperity in the West. As they march east, he's hoping that he can strengthen his own position as the leader of the Christian world. And so he can tell the world, the Christian world, here I am, Pope Urban II, I sent an army, I destroyed Islam, I took Jerusalem back from the Seljuk Turks, I am the most powerful Christian ruler. That would be an absolute direct threat to the prestige of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And don't forget, they had split. The Christian world had split essentially in two between the West and the East over the iconoclastic controversy and other points in 1054. So Pope Urban wanted to free Jerusalem. Absolutely. Make no mistake about that. And he absolutely saw it as, as his religious duty. And he saw the Knights' religious duty as military pilgrims. That's beyond question. But Pope Urban II also had other alternatives. He wanted to strengthen his position at home and abroad. 
and he hoped at some point this would serve as an opportunity to unite the two churches as one again. So there are a couple of sad characters in this story. Uh, one is by the name of Peter the Hermit. Now, Urban's call goes out, and Peter the Hermit, uh, he's a pescatarian. He eats a lot of fish, and he wasn't very fond of bathing. Uh, he leads a mostly unarmed, just traveling band of pilgrims to Constantinople. They murder, pillage, they get in all sorts of problems, and they arrive at the gates of Constantinople. Alexius tells him, why don't you wait for the rest of the army, the professionals? He doesn't. So Alexius shuff, shuttles them across to Turkish territory. There they are slaughtered and sold into slavery and never heard from again. Peter, however, survives. In his reasoning that they failed to cross over because they were supposed to win on faith alone, is they were his followers were not faithful enough. He managed to escape. His followers were sold into slavery. Now this is the general root of the Crusaders. There are a couple of main figures that we're going to talk about. The first two that I'm going to talk about are Godfrey of Bouillon and Raymond of Toulouse. You can see that the course that they came through, they marched through Europe and they met in Constantinople. They're shuttled across by Alexius into Turkish territory. The first stop is Nicaea. Then they go to Doralaeum, an absolutely fantastic story on Doralaeum. Then uh, they go to Edessa, sort of. One party breaks off from Edessa and takes control of it. Then they march out to Antioch, where they encircle the city of Antioch. The city surrenders. They take the city. And then they themselves are encircled. It's a, one of the best stories of the First Crusade is the story of Antioch. I think the story of Antioch, and you'll be learning about this, speaks brilliantly about how faith is the major factor, the major factor in this crusade. It's not wealth, it's not power, and it's not fame. It's faith. And from Antioch, they march down to Jerusalem and reach it, and they take it in 1099, slaughtering up to 10,000 inhabitants. And one witness said, the blood flowed to the ankles of the horses. Godfrey of Bouillon, Raymond of Toulouse, Beaumont of Toronto, and a young hothead by the name of Tancred are four major characters on the crusade. Again, here's the route. And as I had stated earlier, the fall of Jerusalem, they slaughter the inhabitants, Christian, Jew, and Muslim alike. And after the fall of Jerusalem, they establish five crusader states. These are little islands of Christian feudalism in a sea of Islam. And if you look at the map very carefully, you can see that the likelihood that these tiny little enclaves of Christendom are going to survive for very long. It's truly only a matter of time before they fall. Because Islam is not going to be separated for long. They will have a leader who unites them, who once again will take Jerusalem back for Islam.